so okay got it so um i thought i'd have the four panelists uh introduce themselves um and then we'll take questions from the audience so feel free um but we'll do the intros first uh zilma you're first on my uh square thing so mm -hmm. why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your lab setup and philosophy okay so thank you for having me um Simortis gonzalez i am at chop in philly and i um my lab does neurogenetics um and with a focus on the role of mitochondria in neurodegeneration i've had my independent lab let's see for three years now um i think the setup I sort of started maybe similar to places to other people who come from sort of bigger institutions where I sort of started embedded in my mentor's lab and then slowly got my own space. So I think um, some of my experiences informed by that because I didn't have to do a lot of upfront equipment purchases, for example, in the beginning, right, because I could use a lot of share equipment, things like that. Um, and my current lab has uh, two postdoc, two grad students and a research fellow. And it's a wet lab with a lot of IPSL um, type disease models, so. You're next up. Oh, sorry, I'm half muted here, but Renee, you're next up on my. Great, hi, I'm Renee Shellhaus. I'm at the University of Michigan uh, and I am a clinical researcher. Um, I am interested in baby brain development and have different parallel aligned um, projects related to newborn sleep as a marker of brain function, as well as neonatal seizures, um, and collaborate on a lot of early life epilepsy projects. So I like to do a lot of different things, um, which is great um, and keeps me busy. And I have now got five full-time uh, research coordinators uh, who work for me. Um, one uh, is our program manager. She has worked for me for about, oops, excuse me, nine years now. Um, and she does the over oversight day-to-day -day HR piece for the other four, um, coordinates hiring and all of that kind of stuff. Um, we meet together on Zoom mostly now um, since the pandemic started and we were kicked out of the hospital for a year. Um, and now we've outgrown the space that we had um, because we have more coordinators because we have more projects. Um, so we meet together as a larger group once a week. I meet separately with individual coordinators, depending on what their projects is, is going um, as needed, and then meet with my program manager once a week as well. Um, we have a lot of projects at any given time. And so we spend every Every few months we sit down and prioritize projects. Um, you know, what is almost done and we just need to focus on it. What is funded? What money do we need to spend? Um, what's not funded, but we all enjoy um, and wanna make sure that we do that because it's fun. Um, and sprinkle that in with, you know, what's your favorite ice cream and things like that. So we have a lot of fun together. We know each other well um, and really enjoy our work. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Audrey, you're next on my. Yeah, guys, um, I'm Audrey Brumbach. Um, I'm an assistant professor at uh, Dell Medical School at UT Austin, which is my undergraduate alma mater. Uh, and I have, uh, I'm 8020. I have a uh, research lab that primarily uses mice to map out brain circuits in autism. Uh, and I have a clinical practice uh, one day a week where I focus mostly on uh, taking care of kids and young adults who have autism. Um, and so, yeah, I started my lab uh, in 2017 and uh, have, um, was, uh, I currently have a postdoc, a graduate student, um, and uh, sort of two and a half uh, technicians um, working on projects. Um, yeah, I think I've been trying to um, focus on, you know, scientific thinking, really making people articulate, you know, what's your background, what's your hypothesis, um, and really drilling that into everybody, you know, technicians included, you know, so that we're all kind of 
practicing our scientific communication skills and making sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what, what we're doing. Okay, thank you. Alex, you're next. Sure. Uh, I'm Alex Cohen. I'm an assistant professor at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, and officially, I'm actually going through the process of starting up my lab right now and negotiating that um, for startup package and, and with some additional funding I have on board. But um, in practice, I have, uh, and my mentors would agree, I've effectively been running my own research group for a couple of years now. Um, I, am, I do uh, computational imaging work. Um, trying to understand where symptoms come from in autism. So it uses a lot of retrospective data and some prospective MRI uh, research. But because it's all computer-based, um, I've had my own infrastructure for doing research. I've had my, I've, and I've had my own RAs and interns for a couple of years now. So I have um, three RAs and um, three either um, undergrad or um, uh, uh, MD student interns and I have a couple of, of, uh, of the residents that work with me as well. So it's kind of, I have a small army of part-time work, um, which is one way to do it um, um, that's a little bit more cost-effective when you're still just getting started and you don't have full, full salaries to, um, to really support. Um, I meet, we meet virtually, obviously, and actually some of the folks that I've hired never even moved to Boston. They still live about two, three hours away because I hired them right as the pandemic started. And I said, you know, okay, move down once we start scanning. And you know, we just stayed retrospective work for quite some time. Um, so um, because of that, communication is key. And so we've built up a lot of infrastructure uh, for how to stay in communication in real time and also ad hoc. Um, I also do, um, on a weekly basis, we do lab meetings, which are very uh, much like a, a tech startup stand-up meetings, which they would do on a daily basis where we just go around the room and very quickly just say, you know, what was some, something fun you did? What have you been working on this past week? And is there anything you need help with going into the next week? Um, and we found that to be very helpful. It doesn't let everyone know what every what it all is going on, but it makes sure that if anyone needs help, they, they have a, a, a moment when everyone is in the room together and they say, I really need help with this. And someone else can say, oh, I can help with that. Um, so I'm still at the point where um, most everyone is working on all of our projects, but we still have about five or six projects going on at once. Um, so it's been, um, and, and we've just gotten to the point where everyone can help each other and a lot of the skill sets are getting shared. So that's, that's a fun time. So that's kind of where I'm at. Great. So everybody's sort of at different stages. It seems yeah. like that's kind of exciting. Um, so we have a lot of people that I recognize names on your screens, but no faces, but uh, you guys should feel free. I guess you could, you could, you know, type in the chat, but there's not that many of you. So I, I sort of feel like probably just having a conversation makes the most sense. Um, people want to start asking questions or I can pose some questions. If, I'm sure this crowd though, I see some names that I have a feeling you have lots of questions. <laughs> Rebecca, you've unmasked. <laughs> Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Becky, Rebecca Levy. I'm out at Stanford, um, learning from Brenda and everyone else out here. Sorry for the weird background. The internet is out at my home and I am waiting for someone to come by, but I had to go steal internet from outside of the, of the central office. <laughs> um, uh, I guess one, one question that I have, I know that, you know, paths to where people get to can sometimes be a little bit um, circuitous or there can be um, you know, bumps in the road and I'm sure COVID has been one of those, but I'm just wondering as, as each of you reflects back on your path, do you um, feel like there were any things that worked very well or any shortcuts that you wish you had known about or you know, any kind of um, retrospective uh, thoughts about what would have made it easier to kind of get yourself rolling? Good question. I'm sure that there, you know, everybody has their own path and the kind of work that they do, which will have different tips and tricks. Um, as a clinical researcher, I think um, being able to hire my first coordinator who could work independently and enroll kids in studies made a huge and gigantic difference because then I got to, unless instead of sitting, you know, being at the bedside in the NICU putting electrodes on babies' heads, I could be writing grants and analyzing data and it made me much more efficient. So that opened doors tremendously. Um, I think the other piece for clinical research is the balance between hiring lifetime clinical research professionals and hiring people who are going to come and stay with you for 
a year or two while they're getting ready to go to med school or nursing school um, or whatever other path it is, um, is a tricky one. Um, you can hire some very bright people who are going to be there for a year while they do a gap um, and they'll get a lot done, but then they're going to turn over. Um, and you may be able to hire some people who um, gradually really get to know the material and really know your field. Um, and once you find those people, they're golden. And so I spend most of my life trying to keep um, my team of coordinators happy and growing in their careers and like trying to figure out the HR ladders of, because I don't know them, right? <laughs> like, what do you have to do to get promoted to whatever the next rank is? And I don't actually know what the name of the next rank is, but I'm relying on them to tell me um, to keep them happy. Um, while at the same time, making space for the people who are going to come for a year. I was going to share the same sort of wisdom, but from the wet lab perspective. So essentially having investing early in somebody who is either being, for me, was a postdoc that had trained, you know, a couple of years in the labs already was proficient in a lot of the, you know, skills that we needed. And, you know, instead of maybe hiring a technician, you know, which may be cheaper, but, you know, you have somebody who can hit the ground running and can also start training when you have a fresh undergrad, you know technician, somebody like that. So kind of similarly, you know, it's worth the investment if it's somebody who can be more independent and be kind of in a role of a lab manager type person. That's interesting you say that because that was the exact advice that was given to me too. And my, my first hire, um, and actually that's another thing, don't wait until you have um, more money than you think to try and hire someone. You know, if you're at the point where you really need help, talk to your department and say, you know, I'm at the point where I have so many results or so much studies that I could spend all my time writing and I could really use some help to actually do the work. Um, and if, if you've got the support of your department, they should be willing to, you know, help you with that even before you have a startup package, before you have tons of grant money, because it's, it's part of the kindling you need to get there. Um, and I did that um, perhaps even later than I could have um, and they recommended, well, don't just get someone from undergrad. You should get someone who's even more experienced. And I was like, really? But that's going to cost you more money as the department. He's like, no, we, we should, you should do this right. And so I was encouraged to hire someone with a little bit more experience. And I did. And that person has been with me for now three years and she's going off to graduate school, but she was able to manage all of the ju more junior folks in my lab. And that was a force multiplier so that when I'm in clinic, or do or writing, she can actually mentor and teach other people because she's had some of that experience already, and she costs thirty percent more than a straight out a straight out uh, out of undergrad RA, but it was very worth it. And I took over her salary once I could, um, but it's 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 fine to ask, uh, and and they're not. I mean, the only thing they can do is say no, but you'll be surprised at how often they don't say no. And it really is surprising how often they don't say no. They just will give you what you want, you know. And so I think that's that's something I think is good to know when you're first starting out. Mm -hmm. Audrey, you have anything to add? Yeah, I think um, just sort of keep on the lines of, you know, personnel. I think that that's been um, one of the trickiest parts of starting the lab. You know, we have, um, we have experience in mentoring people clinically where, you know, the person that you're mentoring is basically you you know, X number of years ago, who wants to be you X number of years in the future. And so those people are highly motivated to, you know, learn the specific things that you know how to do. Um, I have found it a little bit more challenging in the research environment where you have people who have all sorts of different, you know, career goals. Um, you know, some people are, they just want to come in and do their work and go home. Um, other people are bound for graduate school and, you know, are more interested in sort of career development. Um, and I have found that challenging. And I think that um, that, uh, that balance of um, career people and trainees um, is really important. I think that having that continuity, that sort of institutional continuity that you get from, you know, a, a lab manager who's going to be your lab manager for a while if they work out um, is so um, is is just important for the culture of the lab and for your sanity so that you're not having to reorient people every year to the small parts of your lab um, culture um, and just the, the the workings of the lab. 
Um, but I think having, you know, trainees who are, um, who want to be you, <laughs> you know, I think that that's, um, it's, it's very, um, I mean, it's part of why we all are doing this. Um, and so I think just making sure that you're balancing that um, sort of career scientist and the person who's, you know, who's got a fire in their belly, um, you know, to, to go above and beyond. Thanks. Thanks. Um, one one thing I noticed that you all mentioned is is people and not equipment or things like that. Is that really been key for you to to focus on the people and less on the you know there's, there's key like there's key equipment that everybody need you know that you need to do your like I I'm a patch clamp physiologist and so like I need to you know be able to have a rig that somebody can sit at and with a brain slice um but you know what like there's a whole building of people doing patch clamp electrophysiology and if I were really you know in a in a bad way like I could just go borrow somebody's rig but not everybody can sit at a rig and patch and get good data and so um you know focusing on you know, maybe less less on the equipment side, using what's available to you through your colleagues, um, and and using your um, your startup for people who can you know best utilize the equipment that you have. Peter side joined us. Peter, thank you for joining us. Do you want to just introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your lab philosophy? Hey. Thanks, Brenda. Sorry I'm late. Um, hey, everyone. Good to see everyone. Um, so, I mean, just a brief rundown. So, I'm at UT Southwestern. I'm now, I guess, an associate professor there, um, and primarily in neurology. I'm a child neurologist by clinical hat, but um, in neuroscience um, from a basic science standpoint. I run a lab looking at this the cerebellar regulated circuit um, mechanisms in neurodevelopmental disorders um, with a special interest in autism. Um, and so, that's the brief rundown. Um, you said, Brenda, lab philosophy? Well, um, people will sort of introduce themselves about what their lab looks like and how they set it up. Yeah. So, I mean, largely, um, I have um, been really fortunate to um, kind of set the lab up through um, uh, with a, a lot of wonderful graduate students. Um, so I think what my lab is now six or seven graduate students, I think. Um, I think one just joined. Um, I have one postdoc and, um, a, tech and a technician um, at present. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and I think, I don't know, it just, it's not necessarily by choice or design, um, but I think just kind of the way it happened, um, um, I um, just really got lucky with that number of wonderful you know, early graduate students and, um, and kind of has built That's that. an impressive number of graduate students. Yeah, I'm surprised that that many people would want to hang out with me. I'm <laughs> actually really surprised. Um, but uh, Yes, I think if they want to hang out with each other, I think is actually the main reason, which I'm, I'm, I'm okay pretending I'm okay with that. Mm. Julie Blendy one time told me they're like ants. They form a path and then they all follow the path. So like once you get a few, they all just follow the path. But anyway, other people have um, unmute, un video, video open themselves to video. So I assume they may have questions. Go ahead. I have a, oh. Well, go ahead, yeah. I have a question. I'm Sienna Hunter. I'm at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, and I have a background in bench research and now I'm, I'm doing clinical research. And so as I was trained in bench research, I got to know the components of a uh, bench lab, a wet lab, and am now wondering what is the, uh, along the same trajectory of conversation that we had, I wonder what's the correlate as I build a clinical lab? What is the correlate to a lab manager? Or do I get postdocs in, in a clinical lab? Uh, it's all about your people, right? Um, and you know, you, you can start small and gradually work up. And, you know, we were talking about, you know, who are your career people versus the ones who are going to come and work for you for a year. Um, when I was first starting, I spent a giant amount of time with my new people. Um, we met, you know, a couple of times a week, they would bring long lists of questions. Um, and we would talk through, you know, the ins and outs of all kinds of things related to neurology. They came and hung out with me in clinic. They watched me read EGs, like really got into it um, to connect with the, why are we doing this? 
Um, and that was really important because um, they started to understand what the questions were and why they were important and um, feel empowered to come to me when they had new questions that they couldn't figure out for themselves. Um, those handful of people are just gold now. Um, they know more about neonatal neurology and early life epilepsy than most of our clinical trainees. And um, you know, they're they're great resources. They actually pick up things and they as they look at charts of like, why didn't they try this or that? Um, but it was really all about making sure that they knew that they were valued and um, taking cues from them. Um, you know, I. I've, I'm very lucky with the people that I have. Um, they rarely come to complain to me, but they know that when they do, um, I'll take it seriously. So I think there've been two studies that we've declined to participate in because the people who were running those multi-center studies weren't nice to my people. And we were like, okay, we've got no, no time for that. Moving on, right? Um, but, <laughs> but for the most part, they feel empowered to, um, to speak up and, and to, try things out um, to feed back to me when, you know, you can, you could try that, but parents aren't going to consent to that kind of project because of X and Y. Um, so it's all about people, you know, and we over communicate beyond belief <laughs> to make sure that we're all connected and, and helping each other out when we get to bumpy spots, but also celebrating successes as we go. Alex, you also sort of had that kind of lab sort of? Yeah, I think, you know, there's, I've seen different models um, around me of how to run a clinical slash computational lab. And, and the one that I like, and the one I think works is that, you know, you need some people that are going to stick around or you yourself need to handle the infrastructure part. So the things that, the things that everything is based on, or like in my case, it's like keeping the computers up and running. You know, I can't, I'm not going to outsource that to, you know, the research assistants that are, that are going to come and go in two years because at, at the very, they may help with that, but I need to know how everything's running. So in a pure clinical standpoint, I need to know where we keep all of the paperwork. I need to know where all those things are because I'm responsible for it. And, and that doesn't mean I need to be doing anything with it. You know, they can still do everything, but I need to be like, I need to be involved in that to some extent. So building an infrastructure from the get-go that you understand and is organized the way that you like, even if they're doing the work, I think is, is one way to do it. I know I've, I've seen other folks that just outsource everything completely and they just hire, um, they hire really good people, but, and, and that works too. But then in that sense, you have to also make sure you have a succession plan. So if that person ends up moving on, you need to make sure that you're able to do a full brain dump of everything they know. And that takes a good three to six months you know, so if someone's leaving June 29th or June 30th and the new person's coming in July 1st and like, here's their notes, that's really tough. You know, it's not like, well, we, it's not like we've got this rig and we've got this mouse colony and everything is moving along and you, you need to know how to use the same technique just with these mice. It's like everything is all in our heads. And so there's a little bit more of a dependence on that because less is, less is, is um, uh, protocolized, even though it should be. And the more you can make protocols, I think the better off you are. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are yeah, just my comments on that part, I think, yeah. There's some interesting stuff in the chat. So everybody should be looking at that. Um, yeah, oh, these are Ever all really good ideas. Yeah. What, so what I, is Ever, Evernotes? Evernote. Uh, you know, it's one of these uh, platforms kind of like Microsoft, no, sir. You know, it's it's one of these uh, platforms for note taking, and um, they have a business version where um, the only the owner can delete things, um, and they have version control of the notes. And so I can see, you know, if somebody's gone back and changed something. So it's an electronic notebook um, that allows you to take pictures of handwritten things, take pictures of your mouse cage cards, you know, all that stuff, yeah. um, and have it just in your. Um, electronically so that I can, um, you know, easily review people's lab notebooks and make sure people are documenting things so that we can be reproducible. That, that sounds great. Yeah, that, that's, that's been interesting um, for, for, for computational stuff. I've had a really hard time and I've seen other labs also have a really hard time with electronic lab notebooks um, because we're not, because all of our results are in the computer. The files are huge. You can't pull them in. And so, um, 
If that's not the case, I very much like things like Evernote. And like here, the hospital pays for an institutional license to something called Lab Archives, uh, which is a, has a similar feel. And so definitely reach out to research computing or, or, the, the, or the research infrastructure groups and in wherever you are and see what do they already pay for. Um, Slack, in the, in the same way, um, Slack is really good, but you want to be using either a paid version or see if the institution will cover, will cover things or get you the, the, the educational rate. Um, because if it's an institutional Slack or, or something along those lines, you own everything that's in there. And, and if it's just a personal one that, that, or someone else set it up for you, then they own everything that's in there. And you'll have to, you have to try, try and getting access to that stuff. Um, so in, in lieu of electronic lab notebooks, we've had just to make it a policy of everything has to be self-documenting. So readme files, you know, if you write code, you've got to comment it well, and people don't like doing that because it slows them down. And I say, we're doing this and I'm not requiring you to have a lab notebook. So it's one or the other. And, and because this is research, we're being paid to do this, you know, or this is ta tax dollars at work in some sense, or foundation dollars at work. It's, it's, it's our responsibility to document everything. And so you got to do it in one way or another, um, but trying to make that as easy as possible. There's like a million dollars worth of good information in the chat too. So everybody be looking at that. Like, I'm like, yep, here we go. So yeah. you guys should like write a, an SOP on how to set up a lab. It sounds like this new PI Slack might have some of that in it. Hmm. Cool. All right. Other, other questions. It, did that answer your question? Yeah, that was very helpful. Thank you. Okay. I wanted to say one thing that has been incredibly useful for me is to have um, peers <laughs> that I can have on a text chain and, you know, send gifts to when I'm feeling cranky about whatever and to, you know, celebrate my wins and have people I can, you know, talk about, you know, how things are actually going with and not feel like I need to impress them or, you know, <laughs> They're just, you know, these are people who I'm not competing with. Um, and just to have those people in your life that you can be in close contact with, um, uh, for me has been essential. And that is true for the people who work for you also. Um, so making sure that they have mentors outside of your lab um, can be really helpful. Um, so for, for our institution, there are clinical research coordinator career development activities, and I want them all involved in those things. Um, when they start getting asked to do more than, you know, one-offs here and there, I want to hear about it because I'm paying their salary and I want to know what they're up to. But, um, but there are mentorship programs for them as well. And I love it when they connect with somebody outside of our group because they're going to bring new ideas. Um, and we need new ideas, right? So um, remembering that for people who are um, in this as their career, they want to grow just as much as you do. So seeking out those opportunities is really important. And rewarding their wins too. Um, our currency is chocolate, but you know, I, I used to, when we all worked in, in the hospital all the time, I had a drawer full of fancy chocolate that I would produce when people did good things. That went a long way for me. <laughs> uh, other people have un, a burrito Fridays. <laughs> There's a lot of good stuff going on in the chat still. So, uh, but do people have questions? Please unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I'm Rose Jelena Morrell. So I'm at Children's Mercy in Kansas City and I'm starting up a lab in precision therapeutics and biomarker development and cerebral palsy and dystonia. And I am, um, you know, in the process. So I just hired my research coordinator and she's starting in a couple of weeks. And so, and then I also have a couple of medical students that are working for me and I'm, I'm kind of building up more people that are just hearing about what I'm doing and are interested. And I'm kind of becoming overwhelmed. Like, how do I manage, you know, all these people and how do you know, you know, like, who what's appropriate to give people for like work to do you know I guess for me I like think about this stuff all the time and you know I so I'm always like oh yeah I would I would just you know work on 
projects, you know, a lot, but I, you know, for somebody who's kind of a more regular person who might want to just keep regular hours, like how do I know how much is too much to give somebody to do or what their level is? Um, I'm just thinking about these things as, as people are imminently starting. <laughs> seems like you could all comment on this yeah people want to have some control over their jobs and their lives right so ask them i have people who work four tens i have people who work five eights i have people who work you know whatever hours i always let them flex if it seems like it fits with our all of our goals um but i recognize they're adults and they want you know they have other things outside of, of work that they want to do um, and I try really hard to get to know them so that I can understand that um, and give them as much flexibility um, and autonomy as possible. And then if something doesn't go right, I can be like, you know, we tried that thing and it's not working because of X and Y, let's figure out how to fix it um, and ask them first what their ideas are on how to fix it because chances are they'll come up with something better than I will. Anybody? I, I, oh, go ahead, Alex. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I keep things very, very flexible because of it's all, I mean, most of my folks are working from home and it's all, all computer based. And so I meet with, I meet with everyone in my group, the interns included once a week. And we set out, we set goals for the next week and say, I don't really, you know, it's like, whenever you can do this, whenever you want to do it, that's fine. You know, I'm on Slack pretty much all the time, but I don't expect you to be working all the time. Um, but you know, we, when we try and set realistic goals and then just from week to week, I just slowly start increasing it. And I ask them is like, let me know if this is too much for you to get done or if you're feeling strained and we'll scale down, we'll scale up, we'll figure out how to best support you. And then just start small and achievable and just kind of work up um, until it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> um, but I, I think that, you know, just always ask and always make sure there's a environment that you set the ground rules of like, you know, if I give you, if it's too much to do and you're working continuously and you feel like you're still not getting stuff done, you know, you're not getting everything done we set out, then I need to know that. Um, and so just, you know, make sure that that's, that's a judgment-free kind of thing. Um, the other thing I always, I always start every, every new hire, I always tell them the phrase, you know, work-life balance means that sometimes you're not working during the week. If work-life if work balance means that you always work all day long, the entire week, and then sometimes you're also working on weekends, that's not work-life balance. It's just work taking over your life, you know? So it's like, you can flex your hours. You can set up your schedule however you want. Um, just know that, you know, when we have our meetings and we set our goals of when stuff's going to be done, that's when I'm going to want to see it, you know, and they can work around that. Hmm. I, was, I was curious. I mean, um, you know, graduate students and postdocs are sort of, they're not like on the clock exactly, right? Hmm. But so... That, that is one thing I think you can expect different, you're gonna have different expectations based yeah. on that, but neither one of you, well, actually Renee, you, you don't sound like you have a lot of those kind of people. I do, but there are also clinical trainees in some cases as well. So it's a little different in the, in the scenario I have, you know, I have one T32 fellow um, and other, you know, a ton of residents and, other junior faculty and so on who are working on projects, but I'm really focused on just their individual projects for the most part, rather than them feeding into a different system. So, um, cool. I think uh, said, I think having those expectations clearly defined, whatever it is, and getting and and you know providing specific feedback, you know, having that be an iterative process. Um, is I, I just to echo what others have said. I think it's it can be hard because it can be you know you're busy or whatever or you know maybe they're not communicating effectively and you're so busy it's hard to sort of put the effort into teaching this person how to communicate effectively. Um, but you know uh, just making that sort of a, a being mindful about that part of things that you know teaching people how to how to perform that part of their job is really important. Uh, any, anybody else wanna chime in on this topic? Mm. Other questions from the audience? Elizabeth. Um, 
Hi, I'm Elizabeth Main. Um, I'm also uh, at Stanford um, postdocing in a stroke neuroscience lab. Um, I, one of the recurring themes obviously has been personnel and like how key that first hire is. Um, but I suspect most of us have never hired someone else. Um, and so like, what are the pitfalls that you would like counsel people? How do, how do you like make sure that first person is right for you and your lab, not just right on paper? Cause we, you know, there's like a list of things that we want to look for, but how do make you- sure they, Make sure they interview with your colleagues. Um, so have them meet with, you know, people who are used to hiring people um, so that you get their input. Um, they have to give a talk if they're, you know, if they are postdoc or, you know, graduate student level, you know, that you have to see them present um, their work. Um, check references, call the references. I think also, you know, don't be afraid of letting people go. You know, I, I feel like once I fired somebody <laughs> for just being awful, um, I feel like it kind of broke the seal on that and allowed me to sort of feel empowered, like I'm not trapped in this relationship, you know, like I have the power to be able to, you know, um, to, to end this if I feel like it, it is not working out. And being explicit with people about that, like we're gonna give this a try for, you know, three months and, you know, we'll see at the end of this if it's a good fit. If not, then, you know, we'll, we'll have you move on to something else. Um, Different groups will have different HR policies. So you want to check in with whoever's in HR in your realm um, to make sure, you know, what do you have to have for applications and postings and things like that? Um, what, um, what is the process if somebody's underperforming um, to put them on a performance improvement plan and whatnot? There's a lot of hoops to jump through, um, but getting it right in the first place is also really important. Um, if it's your very first person you're hiring, then you're going to be spending a ton of time with them. So it needs to be somebody that you wouldn't mind spending a ton of time with, right? Um, and who's gonna work really hard and um, be ready to hear feedback and to give you feedback. Um, and I sort of just view them as a colleague, right? Um, once you have some people, then involve those people in making the decision because they're going to spend more time with each other than you will with the you know the second, third, and fourth person you hire eventually. Peter wrote in the in the chat, talk to the references. I would highly, highly recommend that. Do not go by what's on paper. You have to talk to their current mentors or their current bosses, or I just cannot reiterate that enough like do not go by what's on paper 100 it's that pause before they answer that's like the most important thing right yeah, yeah now and now that there's zoom if you can actually zoom and then you can see the body language and you can see the facial expressions when they're making yet yeah, answering that actually you there's a you know it's like playing poker right there's a tell right and if there's a tell like kind of be aware of it right but all that to say i mean I, so talk talk to as many people as you can, but I, I want to echo Audrey's comment about, you know, this is the first time we're doing it, right? You know, and none of us, like we trust ourselves, but we don't trust ourselves and have people with experience who have done it before, you know, with multiple, you know, you know, et cetera, right? At multiple levels to, to interview them, to kind of hear their talk, et cetera, because it can make it that wisdom, that collective wisdom, like at least for me has been hugely, hugely detrimental. And it doesn't mean that you won't make mistakes because, you know, I've definitely hired my share of folks who, you know, just didn't work out. And, you know, kind of to echo another one of Audrey's points of wisdom is, you know, like it's better to let, to kind of, you know, let folks go, if you will. Um, and then to try to say, oh, I can, I can work with this. I will, you know, I'll make it work. I will try to find a way to make it work. And then two years down the road, you're like, it, it really just not going to work. I mean, I think from having that kind of giving yourself a time, and again, depending on all your HR policies, of course, right? Um, and with HR policies, it's just also make sure you document. So if things aren't going well and there are things the performance is not up to standards, it's just make sure you're communicating you know, setting the expectations, letting the expectations be known, 
and then documenting when they haven't met them so that you can meet your HR criteria um, if, if, if it needs to go that way. I think the only thing I would add is that I feel like I get lucky with internal candidates too. So people who were, um, you know, qualified, had really good reviews from their PI, but their PIs were like having a gap in funding or something where they, you know, they would have kept this person, but they, they for whatever reason, um, they needed to move on. And, and I think, you know, um, the last postdoc I hired was, you know, in the middle of COVID, like it was really hard to find people externally, but another PI was like, you know, I really like this person. He's been doing great work, but I'm not sure my grant's going to get funded. And, you know, he, he still wants to stay here. And I was looking for somebody and, you know, sometimes that really works out because you also save the, you know, I don't know, depending on your institution, the two, three month, um, you know, clearance and all that to get them on board it. I think more good in the talk here, just so people are paying attention to this talk. There's all kinds of things going on over there. So one thing that um, that I uh, the advice that I got that I have found to be semi helpful, um, and I'm trying to actually put into practice is um, you're not hiring friends. Um, you know, this is this is a job, um, and they need to be doing the job that you hire them to do. Um, and, and so I think for me, you know, I'm, I'm a real open person. I'm an extrovert. I like chatting with people, you know, like I like to be buddies with everybody. Um, but at some point, like, you know, I have somebody right now that like, I don't know, I really want to get rid of this person, but I feel kind of bonded to them. And so what do I do now? Um, and so just being aware of that, you know, that, that, that that exists that um if you if you become sort of too close with people um it can it can create challenges for you yeah yeah i i had someone who faked data which was like big problem right but hr took me six months so you just have to realize like you know i mean that was a non-starter right from then on, I can trust this person, but it took six months to have them leave the lab. So you just have to document everything and work on it. Uh, other uh, people's questions, we've got about 10 minutes, something like that left. Jules, you're setting up your own lab, right? Oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say, you know, in terms of, mentoring, being a good mentee. So all these people are out there, they want to help you, they want to, you know, give like advice and stuff, but they're busy with their own stuff. And so if you want to establish relationships with, you know, senior faculty, put yourself on their calendar. So when I came here, I put myself, I set up a weekly meeting with one of my, you know, one of the senior people in the department. And, you know, every Wednesday at three, I would at least step into his office and wave hi and say, you know what, nothing to talk about this week. Good to see you. But we had that scheduled time where I knew that I could bring big things, little things, data, you know, all of it. Um, and, and I knew that I was on his, I was on his calendar. So I didn't feel like I was taking up his time. I felt like this was part of his job. Um, and so it doesn't have to be weekly, but I do think that sort of scheduling time with people so that it's there. Otherwise, you know, if things aren't going well, things can, you can kind of end up isolating yourself and you don't want to talk to people because you don't want to show that, you know, you're not doing well as well as you want to. Um, but so sort of continuing to put yourself out there and engage with others and be open with your colleagues and your mentors about how it's really going. Um, that's only going to help you. Good advice. Go ahead, Danielle. You uh, un <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, on video muted. Um, I uh, am curious about how you use uh, or how you manage your fi finances. Um, do people keep spreadsheets? I think our system at CHOP is pretty terrible for being transparent and being able to access your own budget and follow it regularly. So um, how do people approach that? <laughs> oh, and then a follow-up question of, um, 
how much feels like a comfortable amount to spend like do you spend everything you have do you leave yourself a cushion how much of a cushion is the right amount of cushion <laughs> people are answering a little bit in the chat too but yeah. how, how do you guys who does your burn rate for you we, we have a financial person who sends us a graph every month she sends us you know how much our grants have how much is left and what our burn rate is um you know showing it hitting the x-axis <laughs> and so um it that's very helpful um and also just for referring to um being sure that you're talking to your mentors when you're budgeting. Um, I made a big mistake when I submitted my R01 the first time and only put like 40% effort when like really I needed to put 75% effort. So that's what I've done for, you know, subsequent grants. Um, but like, I just didn't know kind of what was conventional, you know, you, you got to talk to the financial people, you got to find out like, how much of my salary do I need to be supplying from grants, you know, and how many grants do I realistically expect to have? That's how much I need to put on this grant in terms of effort. Um, and so, yeah, having having those conversations um, early and often is key. Um, we can, we keep granular records of like each purchase we make so that I can make a itemized budget very rapidly by just copying the lines from our budget spread from our purchasing spreadsheet that are um, that are applicable for the grant. I, I just want to add one thing I've I've very much learned over the past couple of years. Like my my mom is an accountant. And um, I very much learned very quickly, like looking around is, is that running a lab is a small business. You know, hopefully it becomes a big business, but you, you, this part of the training transition is actually learning actual business skills. And so, and it's grant-based budgeting. It's not, you know, profit, -based, profit, it's not pure profit and loss based budgeting, but a lot of the same principles apply. Um, and, and so like meeting with the account, meeting with the finance folks in the department, things like that, mine give me kind of like how much I'm going to have left at the end of the year and like the totals in my accounts, but I didn't really find that to be tremendously helpful. And I started building my own spreadsheets. Um, and then I found that there's a small, like mini company called spendlab.org that you can punch in all of your stuff, um, for, for grant space budgeting, and it'll show you what your burn rate is graphically. Um, without having to send your data to someone else, you know, so it's it's pretty it's cheap. You can use it, you can try it for free if you don't have much of a budget. Um, and I find that to be helpful. Um, but at the end of the day, the gold standard it really is like the accounts. And once you get big enough, they should be doing a lot of this for you. When you're first starting off, they may not, and you you really only have a fraction of like the finance person that helps with a bunch of people as they're getting started. And so you want to have a handle on this yourself. Um, one of the big things about it being a business is that just like um, just like was just said, you know, you want to be record keeping is everything. And, and so keep line item, like keep a log of every find every purchase in and out, you know, keep that, keep that somewhere. And so even though the accountants are doing it too, if you have it on hand, ready to go, um, you'll always be able to, 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 to do your, your re reconciliation and figure out what's going on and how much money you're going to have. Um, and, and what kind of burn rate and when, when do you cross that? x-axis is going to be helpful uh is going to be worrisome i think that changes um it's going to look very short early on um but that's normal and you're not going to be making a profit you're not going to be you know self-sufficient for several years and that's that's normal you should be getting some support somehow um, or even or that's where you know working with a mentor mentors group is part of it but then over time that should start extending out to the length of your grants One thing I would say is that, you know, those accountants work for you or they work for your boss. And if they're not doing their job, you can go find, you can say to your boss, I can't work with this person. She's crazy. I've done that. Like, this is not going well. I don't understand what she's doing with my finances. So your boss should care. So get a new person. <laughs> yeah, they work for you. Remember that. And if they don't explain something, you can understand, like, I didn't understand the forms they were sending me. I was like, I don't understand this. And I made them just sit there and explain it to me over and over until I understood it. That was when I realized they were crazy. Uh, nobody understood it. But you, you see what I mean? Like, it's their job. Sorry, that's a little pain point for me. Um, I think also for, for clinical research, um, you can't just keep a spreadsheet. It won't line up. 
um, you know, people's benefits change and your the amount that they charge for whatever test it was changes and it hits your account whenever it hits and sometimes it doesn't. And so making friends with all the people who manage all of those things is helpful, but I could never possibly make a spreadsheet that really explains all of our finances. And so I have to trust that people are doing a good job. And like Brenda said, I'll sit there and just ask questions after question after question until I have my head around yeah. it, feel confident. And I bring along somebody who's an administrator that I have worked with for years and I trust. And even though it's not her job, she is willing to do that. And so she will sit there and listen and ask the pointed questions to get the answer as well, which is very, very helpful. Yeah. It's not something we're taught, right? Like, I don't understand any of that. Like, so anyway. Um, okay. One more thing for your question, Danielle, about your cushion. Like how much do you, I, for me, I was like, you know, I have the one person that I trained initially who was like my right-hand person and my cushion is like, I have to make sure I have this person's salary covered you know, just in case until you get more funding. So if you have somebody or I don't know, some resource that you know is essential, making sure that your cushion covers that. But you can always go to your boss and ask for more. Sure. I mean, they may not give it to you, but you can always go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, um, last question. Anybody? I, I just, Jewel just came and gave an amazing talk at Stanford, and I was shocked at how small her lab is. You deserve a bigger lab. So yes, give her advice really on good. how to get her lab to grow. That I'm would be my boss for more money. Good, but other ways to help her yeah. grow her lab. Anybody? No. <laughs> on Twitter. Be a great collaborator and then you will get to grow organically as I think that it's, it, you know, that brings the joy to the job. And then when one thing's working and another one's not, it's okay because one thing's working. I think putting yourself out there in terms of, you know, get on social media, you know, advertise the work you're doing, um, you know, yeah, I think that 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 is also a helpful way to sort of make yourself a known entity. And I think joining, like I was very hesitant to joining like admissions committees, but then I realized that when you interview all the incoming people, right? Like all the new grad students that are not starting yet, you kind of get FaceTime with them before they meet other faculty, which can be very helpful for, you know, wet lab type people who will need hands um, down the road. So that's another potential way to put yourself out there. What did people do when their, let's say their boss wouldn't cough up the money that they deserved? Has that happened? Any negotiating thoughts for her? That would be another hour, Brenda. Okay, so we can do that if you want. But read, uh, read getting to yes. Oh, interesting. That's that's the book. That, that's that's what I was just, I was just gonna say exact same thing. That's that is the book. <laughs> read getting to yes okay never heard of it but good all right well i want to thank you all this was amazing i learned a lot and i will get a new book um and uh thank you again uh the next session is next month and it's going to be very unusual because i've decided that we're going to do some exercises on mentor mentee relationships and there'll be exercises so everybody will come and kind of write down things as we go I, i've been reading about it so we'll see how it goes it may be terribly boring but i'm hoping it will be helpful so join us next month as well and i want to thank all the um mentors here so thank you guys it was great bye it was really fun. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good luck. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thanks so much.